got David Leary here with us today to talk about pre-disaster planning. So we're going to kind of get down into the into the meat and potatoes of all of this. So David received his BA in social work. Hey, even MSW. There we go. Uh, from NC from North Carolina State University and his master's in social work from the University of Texas at Arlington. Where? What year? What year? What year? Oh, uh, when was that? <laughs> okay, way before me. Um, he has worked in public health for over 20 years. His career began in social work services with chronic and disabled children, recruiting and assisting medical providers to serve vulnerable populations. He began his emergency response career as a volunteer with the Red Cross. His involvement with fires and sheltering placed him in managing shelters during Hurricane Katrina. Soon after that, Mr. Leary began working for Public Health Preparedness and Response and has been the regional manager since 2012. He has responded to numerous events such as hurricanes, disease outbreaks, and forest fires, as well as two years humanitarian work overseas. So please help me welcome David Leary. Well, this has been real interesting. Um, I was asked to speak on pre-disaster recovery, pre-disaster uh, stuff, and I was like, okay, I need six months. <laughs> Um, and there's like been books written on this and I was going well let's see I have about you know 40-ish minutes and so I was thinking what can we talk about and um, and get it's, it's a really how, can you ever plan enough can you ever get enough going or uh, when you're preparing for a disaster something that you don't know is going to happen can you do enough planning and there's always no there's not enough there's always something else and so um, Part of my current job is always uh, learning how to um, manage being behind uh, because you can, you're always planning and working on something and somebody's always wanting uh, something due. And so you just sort of learn to live in ambiguity, which uh, prepares you for the next disaster. One of the things, I've worked in numerous hurricanes in different capacities, operation centers, shelters, uh, different things like that. Um, Every disaster, even if it's the same kind of disaster, um, they're all different. Every hurricane's different. Um, every uh, fire is different. Um, every flood I've ever worked ends up being different. There's always a different component to each one of those uh, disasters. And I'm always left sort of dumbfounded a lot of times. So as I, um, um, technical difficulties. That's also a good part about disasters. It always happens. <laughs> and presentations. Um, which really brings me into uh, how do you plan for things like this. And, <laughs> and um, it's actually part of my presentation at some point. But I started thinking about um, if you're, when you're planning, when you're trying to prepare for a disaster that you don't know when it's going to be and what it's going to be, um, what are some things I could share with y'all, especially Van Zant County, who's trying to, trying to make a career of this, it seems, uh, the last couple of years, um, that, you know, what can you say? We've got great speakers here, people with a lot of experience doing a lot of research on it. Um, and so really what I'm going to do is share some, some small, some basic aspects of how to prepare and um, just some, some of the things I've learned um, in, um, that I've experienced and um, then hopefully that'll help and it'll, it'll route into this toolbox that'll be a great idea. Um, I'm big on uh, toolboxes and if you think about toolboxes you've got one at home they're small they're large um, usually you're going on a project you're pulling out a few tools I mean you're not using the whole toolbox you bring the whole toolbox with you but a lot of times you're just picking out a screwdriver or a hammer um, you know, you're all scrounging through, looking for something, you put pulling out a few to go get your job done. So that's kind of the way I look at this toolbox. Uh, some communities are going to need to do the whole thing. They're going to be starting at ground zero. Uh, some communities like Van Zant County um, or Range County, they've gone through several things. They've got plans, they've got relationships going, but there's going to be things in that toolbox that, oh, I went and thought about this. So you can pull pieces of that out. So I think the toolbox is going to be a great, great idea. Um, and I may be shooting this from the hip. <laughs> did you print out your slides? I did not. <laughs> but I do have my computer. Oh. So but when in doubt, reboot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I, but I can start without them. So um, what, I do, what do we do? I work for the Department of State Health Services, Preparedness and Response. Uh, in our region, we have uh, eight regions in Texas. Um, our region, uh, four or five north, they number them. 
Um, uh, we are 35 counties of East Texas. Um, some of those counties are covered by preparedness contracts with uh, local health departments. Net Health, which covers Van Zandt County, Russell's the manager. Um, we have Cherokee County, who's here represented. We have Angelina counties and cities, they cover three counties. And Jasper Newton County, and um, uh, they cover four counties yeah. down in the southeast corner of our region. Uh, we cover uh, the CDC grant that we get has 15 capabilities. Uh, we just have realized that we're adding capabilities to that. Uh, they call them core functional areas uh, that kind of go in line with what FEMA has. And that covers um, basically we are responsible on the emergency service function eight, which is those uh, functions are numbered. Uh, they have one for mass care, they've got one for oil and gas, they've got all these different uh, areas that are supposed to be uh, covered during a disaster, uh, kind of an organized fashion from the federal government down to the state, down to the, uh, they're usually at the state level, the Texas Department of Emergency Management, uh, we refer to as TDM. They um, give these functions to each state agency or a non-governmental agency uh, to cover. Um, Department of State Health Services covers the health and medical component and so we're the ultimate responsibility for everything from uh, mass fatality, epidemiology, community preparedness on the health medical end. Um, the acute care medical part is a hospital preparedness grant and we work closely with the uh, tra trauma service areas. Uh, SETRAC is here representing from Houston. We work real close with them. And so we do a whole lot of partnership and uh, pulling together our resources and finding out who can cover what. Um, things change a lot over time. Since I've been doing this, what we were using for um, mass care back in 2008, we're not using it anymore. We're using different terms, um, different policies and laws change. So a lot of these uh, forms we were using, uh, toolkits we were using, we formed to help us do uh, sheltering and evacuation, repatriation, we had to chunk out and start all over again. That's just the nature of working in uh, preparedness and disaster response. Um, so the big part of how we cover um, different things is knowing who who can help who can do those things um, with all those capabilities uh, depending on who you're talking to 15 or 17 you would think we would have a staff of about 50 and we don't we are doing it with a regional staff of uh, 11 right now and we um, we call on our partners a lot because it's the only way we can cover those things at the time so one of my slides had a picture of Japan <laughs> And do you remember the Japanese earthquake that happened back in 2011? What do you remember about it? You couldn't say the name of it. <laughs> what do you remember about the earthquake itself? What was that? You remember Fukushima nuclear plant? What else happened? What caused that meltdown? It was a tsunami. I don't remember any pictures of buildings collapsed or anything like that. We remember the tsunami and then Fukushima took it all over. It was, uh, it was after effects of a disaster. And I don't think, the, and the Japanese have done a lot of work towards uh, earthquake mitigation and response. And they've even done a lot of work on tsunami mitigation and response. Um, really impressive walls, dams, dikes, all kinds of things like that. I don't think anybody guessed in a million years their uh, nuclear power plant would have gotten knocked out. They had taken steps for that to be mitigated that and it completely um, took them by surprise. The earthquake scientists knew there was an earthquake probably going to come at some point. They never dreamed that it was going to be a, um, uh, a nine when it happened and they knew there would probably be a tsunami, they just didn't realize how big the tsunami was gonna be. It completely overwhelmed them. And I would say probably for uh, earthquake mitigation, the Japanese were probably in the top tier in the world in, in working with that, and they got just blown away by it. Another slide I had 
was uh, Hurricane Harvey 2017. I, you know, for doing this, uh, we have a good recent example. Uh, who remembers where the, uh, the uh, hurricane made landfall? Rockport, yeah. But what do you remember about Hurricane Harvey? Yeah, what, what, what made all, yeah, it was Houston. Houston made all the news. I mean, yeah, they are the fourth largest uh, populated city in the nation. But poor little Rockport got cold cocked by a Cat 4. <laughs> and nobody remembers a whole lot about Rockport after Houston basically went underwater. I mean, it was one thing after another. I mean, uh, it just basically, they were on their own. And I remember seeing all the people that went to go help Rockport they were pulling resources out of that area and sending it to Houston. They had to. Uh, and so I often wonder what it felt like to be in Rockport going, hey, where are you going? You know, <laughs> you know that kind of thing. You know, that's just kind of the way it happened. Um, some other interesting things were just all the records that were broken. Um, you know, just watching the footage of, um, of Houston underwater. I mean, we used to talk about Tropical Storm Allison and all the damage it did. Well, nobody will ever remember Allison again. Because, um, I mean, basically, I mean, literally, we, you were only able to supply things by helicopter. I mean, everything went underwater. Um, the other, what are some other things you remember about uh, after effects of Harvey? Comes to your mind. Come on, I know y'all are watching the news. The YouTube videos, I know you saw them. Other than water, what happened? What, do you remember the, uh, the chemical plant? Oh, yeah. The what? The Cajun Navy. The Cajun Navy, exactly. <laughs> we'll talk about volunteers. <laughs> yeah, the dams. Who would have, uh, nobody, I mean, that wasn't on anybody's radar that that would have become an issue because there's no water in those dams <laughs> on a normal day. There's, you know, maybe a little bit, but not much. But they filled up and they had to let the water out. Yes. Right. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of finger pointing going on in Houston right now. I, I can guarantee it in Harris County. Uh, the other part was is, um, it went from Rockport to Houston, and then as the rain continued, Beaumont went underwater, Orange, and uh, all those places, and then they totally lost all their water. I mean, their water completely went out. You, know, you can do without electricity, but, and it get hot and you get cranky, but you need water. And so it's, it, it got to be disaster after disaster after disaster. It was one thing after another. Um, Beaumont got 26 inches of rain in 24 hours. I mean, they just went underwater. Um, I think uh, Cedar Bayou had 52. Uh, what was that? Do you remember what that was? I think, I think the final was like 58.6. Yeah, something insane. I'll let you know that Texas had the record for the most uh, flood in a storm uh, from the past. Um, we just decided we needed to break it again. <laughs> Thank you, Cedar Bayou, for doing that. You know, I don't think anybody's going to catch up with that anytime soon. Um, but there's a lot, it's always the disaster, it hits, and then there's all these multiple cascading things that happen along with it that nobody really, no, you couldn't plan for it. To kind of give you an idea, we were talking with our um, James Kelly, who's our DSHS uh, preparedness exercise coordinator and training coordinator lead. He was saying that he would never have written a scenario, an exercise scenario about Hurricane Harvey. He said nobody would come play. They'd call me crazy because how do you, you can't make this stuff up. He said nobody would ever have done that beforehand. Lori, how many hospitals completely got knocked out? We had 23 hospitals that were shut down and uh, 20 nursing homes that were closed. So it was much better than what we had in ICE. We've learned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I don't want to steal any thunder from y'all's thing coming up, but the other thing that did work from Allison is y'all put in submarine doors on some of the... So some of the hospitals that flooded in Allison did not flood for Harvey, which was worse. Um, so James basically said we'd never have written this before. I mean, you know, you never know what will happen. So that's kind of my point. You never know what's going to happen and how bad it's going to be. 
Van Zandt County's had multiple tornadoes. The next tornado might be very different. I mean, you're prepared for some things. There are some things you have no idea. And so it really leaves, anytime you're doing um, hazard mitigation or what your uh, uh, potential hazards coming up, you know, we do in East Texas, it's floods, tornadoes, pretty much, um, and fires. But you're, you're always sort of in the back of your mind, you're going, what am I not thinking of? How am I not planning? What am I leaving out? And you can't cover everything. I mean, the next thing you know, people will start thinking that there's gonna be space shuttles crashing through Texas. What, I mean, that never happened, you know, and it did, you know, just to kind of give you an idea. <laughs> Go ahead. This kind of supports that statement that says, when man plans, God laughs. Yes, he did. Um, I had to eat crow um, back when the Ebola thing was going on in West Africa. Um, I was doing a staff meeting and we were just bringing up some sessions, some things that were happening in the country and we were planning for stuff and we were just putting some things that were going on uh, across the world and I brought up, this was back in the spring when the only thing that was really going on, the only people that were responding to the uh, Ebola in West Africa was uh, Doctors Without Borders. And they were starting to call out, they were ringing the bell, going, hey, something's going on here. We've got a couple thousand people that are dying. This is unprecedented. And I put up a map and I told everybody, I said, this will never happen here. <laughs> and about three months later, we had three cases in Dallas. I thought, you know, this is crazy, you know. So, um, I, I know, I know, yeah. it, literally, I do, I don't say that more, I just said, yeah, that's not going to happen, and I, and I do like to tell people that, uh, yeah, I do like to tell people, I said, you know that Japanese earthquake thing, you know that that's where Godzilla came from, I'm just saying, <laughs> the whole nuclear, if you watched it as a kid, yeah, that's what happened. Let's thank our IT people. Yes. All right. Which one's the board? So, oh. so, yeah, that should advance it. Well, it seems kind of slow right now. It's all right. Just have to back up. I might have to do it from here. So my objectives, there it went. <laughs> um, let's see. It makes noise. This one? This one. That's forward? That's forward. Okay. All right, there we go. So I kind of did objectives, um, and I kind of kept them general. Um, so this is kind of showing you, probably can't read it too well, but the emergency support functions uh, that come down from FEMA, uh, we're ESF-8. Um, and you can see there's a lot of them. There's the ones you think about, like firefighting and emergency management. Uh, there's one uh, ES ESF-12 ESF is energy. So there's a, just kind of gives you an idea. There's somebody thinking that in each section, something needs to be planned somewhere on these things. Uh, this shows a map of our region, 4-5 North. Um, uh, Net health is the white counties. Um, and just by population wise, they probably, uh, or just probably a little bit more of over half the population of our region. Uh, Tyler, Longview, uh, those uh, cities uh, have the most people in them. Um, Jasper Newton County is green. Um, the pink, three counties, is Angelina County and cities, and then Cherokee County is about in the middle. Um, Department of State Health Services, four or five north, we cover the purple counties, and most of those are rural. And so um, definitely understand when you're the emergency managers where there's a staff of one and that's just one of the hats they wear. Uh, some of our emergency managers are doing like three or four jobs. Um, and so that's just the nature of being in a rural area. Um, ESF-8 in our, when we're planning, it's multi-agency multi coordination. So it's the public health side and the acute medical care side are together and then we're working with uh, emergency management. We're often working under their uh, instant command structure as a, a part of uh, responding to an event, which, whatever it is. That's the Japan slides, real pretty. Um, 
I don't, the X is where Godzilla will probably come from. <laughs> um, you know, one thing about the Hurricane Harvey slide, if uh, it took up the whole coast of Texas, um, from Brownsville all the way to Orange, Texas, and it flooded parts of southeast Louisiana, if it had, the other thing about uh, Harvey, if it had just done what typical hurricanes had done and then hit the coast and then moved on, we would have never had the Houston flood the way it would. Uh, now, it would have flooded if it had acted like a typical hurricane. It would have come inland, the system would have collapsed, and we would have probably gotten a good 20 or 30 inches of rain somewhere, probably Van Zant County. So, <laughs> I'm just, just, just letting you know. Um, and that's generally what they've done. They'll generally drop all their water somewhere else. The other thing I thought about, um, they sent me to Houston to work to help our region down there do some things during the Harvey um, event. And uh, I started thinking that if Har Harvey, not acting like a typical hurricane, it was not doing what it was supposed to, it just sort of lingered, stayed around, went back out in the Gulf, sucked up more water, went back on land, dumped some more. If it had moved east uh, about 50 miles, um, it would have dumped the, you know, the big rain bands were on the right side. It would have dumped all that rain in New Orleans. Does anybody know what was going on during this time in New Orleans? You might remember reading anything about it. Their pumps weren't working. I mean, I remember right as Harvey was coming up into the, uh, to the coast, New Orleans was frantically trying to fix their pumps. Talking about preparedness. Now, this, we need to move this down there. Um, they should know better. Um, that would have been a catastrophe because that 56 inches of rain in, uh, in that area would have really, um, it would have made uh, Katrina look um, simple. The other thing Harvey didn't do in terms of planning, um, our uh, region and our agency, we work off hurricane plans with 120 hour uh, kind of plan area. 120 hours is what we think when we start thinking it's going to hit. We have uh, benchmarks and things we start doing at certain hours. Um, Harvey didn't plant, he didn't, it decided to throw away the 120 hour playbook. In about two days, two and a half days, it went from a um, regenerated tropical storm into a Cat 4 hurricane. Um, it just did not want to play right. And so that's kind of what I've learned about all my years of working in disasters. I always go, I thought. You know, in my next sentence is usually, but I thought. You know, and so there's a lot of things that happen that we assume. We always are managing assumptions. Um, already, people are managing their assumptions about the next hurricane because they're already thinking about Harvey. But the next hurricane is going to be different. I have a favorite quote uh, by Evan Thomas in one of his books. He says, in war, as in almost everything else, assumption is the mother of error. <laughs> and it is, um, I can't tell you how many times just within Harvey I was going, oh, but I thought, you know, didn't now, um, let me call, didn't you have that? Oh, that equipment's not there. But I thought, you know, I thought that was in my warehouse. No, that, remember we threw that away. Oh. So... There's a lot of talk about plans and standard operating guides or standard operating procedures. And this is the end result of planning. Um, generally, when the disaster happens, we don't re generally reach for the plan. It's generally a narrative. It talks about who's going to do what and how they're going to do it. Um, things change. Uh, you don't usually go to read a narrative when you've got to act real quickly. But the plans are important because it starts that process of how you're going to act and what you're going to do when a disaster hits. And so these plans change all the time. They're organic documents. Um, I would say most of our plans that we have now today are out of date just because things change. Um, systems change, agencies switch, uh, different things like that. They constantly have to be updated. But everybody knows we have 50 people working for us and we can do that all the time. And that, that's, that's a joke, we don't. We don't have 50 people, we have 11. <laughs> so we work a lot with leveraging our resources. And I think for rural counties and rural, rural jurisdictions, leveraging resources is really the only way you can plan for and prepare for the next disaster. 
uh, the toolkit would be a great, great way to do that. And so um, when you're, a, when you're a one, you have a staff of one, and you know who's going to be doing the response initially. You know, a lot of times the disaster is mainly focused on who's going to be actually doing the search and recovery. You know, that's everything, that's when the news media show up, they want to see people pulled off roofs and, you know, they want to see the damage, that kind of thing. The disaster for the county and how it's worked, really it's the chronic stuff afterwards and the uh, unintended consequences of the disaster that take up so much time. Uh, what are some of the things that, who are the, who are the first people you think of when you think about disaster response? Firemen, police, police right, the EMS, that kind of thing. It's that real acute response kind of stuff. I think for rural counties, it's pulling people together and saying, who's going to be able to shelter or how do we take, what goes on with sheltering? Um, I think the one thing I'd like to get across with the art of leveraging is you don't have to know anything. That's the great thing is you don't have to have a degree you don't have to be an expert. Basically, you do have to take the effort to say, hey, look, we need to get together and talk. We need to pull some people together, and we need to start just talking and writing stuff down on a, on a pad. And, I mean, that's all it takes. It, ta it doesn't take money. Donuts and coffee help, definitely. <laughs> but it doesn't, take, it doesn't have to take a lot of money. So the art of leveraging your resources is pulling together what's in your community already and who can do what. And a lot of times people don't, a lot of times the people you bring together don't even know that what they can do, uh, who can help. Um, one thing I like to tell emergency managers is uh, they usually like to say, look, we don't have money and we don't have staff. And so it's hard to fill out our uh, instant command structure or org chart. And so a lot of times I say, look, or, uh, this is a pretty big event in your county or your school's closed. And they say, yeah, we've closed the schools for a week. I said, that's great for you. Teachers make great people that you can plan beforehand, pull them into your ICS structure, give them, because here's why. Most of us, if I were to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you in as a substitute teacher in a seventh grade class in a middle school, your blood would run cold, you know? <laughs> I mean, Teachers, uh, they deal with uh, little mini disasters and chaos all day long. They're not, they're not rattled by a whole lot. So you need people who are calm, they can follow instructions, they know structure. School teachers are good, especially when the schools are out for a week, if they're not already affected. Other people, there's other different groups around that may fit that mode for filling out just your basic ICS structure in a, in a rural county. And a lot of times those are all the, all the best thing. Anybody, anybody else think of some other groups or people that you can tag to help fill out your ICS structure that you don't think about normally? In a rural situation, all the farmers, they've got equipment, they're industrious. That's true. The tractors, you can't find that in the city. True, and that's the big, that came up in uh, Dr. Schwab's thing about rural communities that tend to know more people where you can pick the phone up and say, hey, can you reuse your stuff? Or I know so-and-so or that church or that people generally pull together pretty quick. And that, then we saw, we saw that happen in Van Zandt County a lot. But um, if, when you're the emergency manager or the county judge, you do want to know what's going on and whether you have, you don't want a lot of freelancers. And um, I mean, we all have stories on that. Um, volunteers are great, but that, that's a good one. Is there another one? Is there another group you can think of that come up? Restaurants. Churches. Restaurants and churches, yeah, definitely food. A lot of people are willing to, especially when power's off, they got to get rid of it anyway. <laughs> and, and a lot of times people too, um, I think that's, uh, I'm going to bring this up, but who you use and what equipment they bring, um, you can document that, and that gets counted towards what you've spent. And that's, that's a big one on that one. But I think the big thing is, is you don't, know have, you don't have to know how to do this. You don't even have, you've, maybe you've never even responded to a disaster before. All you need to know is how to bring people together. That's the big thing. So there's a lot of documents, the books, articles about pre-disaster steps. Um, 
I just pulled that one that was a one I had one I had already about uh, resilient, sustainable communities. And so visioning is kind of what we've been talking about, uh, leveraging your, uh, your just your partners that are around, uh, engaging them, uh, and that can go on different ways. You start with your fire, your police, your EMS, you can start just with them and work. The other thing too is that each of these steps always think about what your assumptions are um, and always question the assumptions. I can't tell you how many times I have seen in a Annex H that each county has to have where DSHS has said, yeah, they're going to do this. And I was going, I didn't know I was in there. And no, we can't do that. You know, and so there's a, always engage your partners, ask questions, and always, um, there's always assumptions on both sides. Make sure you understand clear and directly what people can and cannot do. It's a big deal on that. Uh, we talked about needs assessments, um, hazard vulnerability assessments that are from um, that the state may require. There's different community health needs assessments, um, and, and again, um, these are not assessments that maybe you have the time to do if you're the staff of one. But there are groups and people and agencies out there that have already done them. Yeah, they already have the data. Just pick up and give them a call. That's all you have to do. It's, uh, it's also managing who your partners are and what they have. A lot of them maybe, if they don't have this already completed, they can get it done or talk about how to, how to help you get it done. Um, that's, a, that's a big way of just delegating things you need on getting that information. Um, so planning. Um, what, what are some other other than fire and EMS and um, your police, what are some, let's say just taking tornado for example, what is a big immediate need that happens after sort of a tornado flood event? Roads, the roads and electricity and bridge, exactly. So that's a huge infrastructure thing. It takes a lot of equipment, fuel, you gotta have staff. Who is that? Who is it for, say Canton? Who is it for the county? you know, whatever your municipality is, there's an assumption. You may say, hey, road and bridge, uh, would you be able to do this? Yeah, we can take care of that. Uh, but they only have two backhoes and a dump truck. That's it. And, but you've got a whole county. See, so there's some assumptions they're going to get that done. Um, that's where some questions need to be asked. You know, um, well, how much could you do and how long does it take you to get this done if this stretch of county road is all the trees are gone and the, it's covered the roads up? How long would that take? Just asking questions and starting that discussion of uh, scenarios helps people think, well, you know, maybe, maybe we couldn't get that done in a day like I thought. Um, there's a lot of that kind of thing. Who, who do you call when all the electricity's out and who do you work with and what does that mean? I mean, there's a lot of assumptions on that uh, that go with how do you handle and manage that? It's maybe something you don't have that cap capability of doing at all, but you do want to know that when the event starts and you set up your ICS instant command structure, that you don't have the electric company coming in and working apart from what your disaster response is doing. You want to pull them into your operation center, but you need to talk to them about that before the event happens, that kind of thing. Um, the improvement planning, com community improvement planning, uh, Dr. Schwab really covered a lot of that, that mitigation, talking, how do you, uh, how do you cover that? And pre-disaster recovery planning, I'm not going to steal Dave's thing, but definitely you're planning for recovery before the event ever happens. And uh, that's kind of what we're doing in, in this uh, discussion here of this uh, meeting we're having today, is how do you set up in a city or a county a recovery board when nothing's ever happened, when it's clear blue, slides, uh, clear blue skies outside and you're asking people to say, hey, we need to plan for recovery, <laughs> a bad recovery. You know, let's get things set up now. What is that going to look like? And who can we ask? Uh, how do we get that going? That kind of thing. Um, so implementing these things, seeking and applying resources and set bench benchmarks. As you talk with your partners and you set up things, you realize that, yeah, we might need some more of this kind of equipment. 
we're going to need these kind of staff. What are those benchmarks that really need to be set up for um, making that happen in terms of an end result? Doing that on a blue sky day is a lot easier than trying to figure that out in the middle of a disaster. It gets really hairy on those kind of things. So I would say probably every disaster I've ever worked in, the big issue that came up was communication. Every after action report, every after, after, after action meeting I ever participated in, communication was one of the big things that came up. We didn't have contact with these people, we weren't talking to these folks, we didn't know what they were doing, or we weren't getting this right information to hear, or we've got to set up a different system or process for doing that. The communication was a huge thing, and it, there was a communication on the internal level in terms of your responders and who you had in your operations center and your partners, and then there's communication to the public, which is a big thing. And it all comes down to who needs to hear what your message is, um, how does the message need to go out? Um, our group over here this morning was talking about how, you know, we talk a lot about social media, but there's a lot of people that do not use any form of social media. Um, I read a recent article about New Orleans that people in Lower Ninth Ward and some of those other wards that were hit pretty hard, there are a lot of people living without electricity, living uh, in squatter homes, and they're basically living off the grid. Um, these are people for the next disaster that, how do you get in contact with these people? Um, that's another whole communication method that needs to happen. And the big thing is too is perception. How do you handle your communication to the public? You might be doing everything right and if they don't feel like they're being heard or they feel like you're not telling them the truth, the perception is going to go negative and then things go south real quick. Uh, I think we've all seen multiple examples over the last couple of years where businesses and governments, uh, municipalities handled a situation very badly in their crisis communication mode and it just went crazy. Um, so important notes, things to think of. Um, I put in volunteers, donations. Um, COOP stands for um, your continuity of operations. How do you keep your most basic operations going within your business and or your, uh, your uh, government, uh, local and county. How do you keep it going? What needs to keep going during the disaster? And the administration during the disaster. So your volunteers, they're sort of a great thing going on. That you love having the volunteers, they can also be a problem. And so that's like another whole section that can be done on volunteers. Um, the Medical Service Corps has this slide, uh, they call them SUVs, Spontaneous Unaffiliated Volunteers. If you can't see, the three guys are in uh, hazmat suits and the guy in shorts is beside them. Uh, that happens a lot. Um, Lori shared how there were firemen going into water in Houston in bunker gear and they could feel the electricity, the water was still electrified. But you still had your uh, Cajun Navy zipping all around, you know. We, but unfortunately, we had some deaths from uh, people getting electrocuted. So where do you need your volunteers the most? If you're thinking about in a rural county, you're thinking, how can we respond to whatever the event is, all hazard event? Where do we generally show up? You know, these big hearty people, we need them. Where do, where do they show up? Do we have a place to start coordinating them? Um, do we have somebody that can handle that? Do we have a process for doing that? When we really need people, do we need a whole bunch of people that we don't know what they do, but really what we need is dump truck drivers, you know, that kind of thing. It's a lot of things where you need them now. Uh, there's a lot of people that will show up and say they can drive a dump truck and they had not dri driven one in 10 years. Uh, it could be a problem. Um, can you roster a lot of these people beforehand? What, are there people already doing that? And so there's a whole section, I think sometimes in our um, county or city plans, uh, there's a lot of places for attachments or, or just extra stuff we can put on the back of that plan, that Annex H or whatever it is. Some things we can put in there and start talking about. You may not have to do anything with the plan, but there may be some sections in there we need to talk to some other people. You may, there may be an organization that can handle all your volunteer stuff. But you still need to have somebody that's in charge, that's under their 
purview in your ICS structure, in your event. If you've got somebody handling your volunteers, you still need to know what's going on because it all goes back to communication. You don't want a negative thing to be going on over here with your volunteers and it comes back around, the media goes, hey, we heard you're mistreating the volunteers. What? You know, that kind of thing. Um, when I was doing, uh, during Katrina, I ended up doing a lot of shelter management um, and, you know, shelters that were supposed to handle 200, we were handling 400. Um, it was great to have a lot of volunteers, but a lot of times as a manager, I would say probably over half my time was watching the volunteers because I had a lot of people that didn't know what they were getting involved in and they would just melt down right on the floor. You know, it's like, hey, let's go fold towels. You know, you know, it's kind of like, I don't want, maybe I don't need to let you get out of here, but I mean, you get weird stuff. People act really strange when they get stressed or they get emotional. Um, it's, um, there were times where I would go in the back, make sure nobody's looking and start throwing stuff, you know, that usually helped. But um, you have your own little ways. I wouldn't advise drinking or anything like that. Doing the, throwing something's a lot better. Volunteers are a big thing though, don't forget that. Um, donations. So this one can be a big one. We've had um, 18 wheelers show up with nothing but teddy bears, you know? And I'm mean, you're like, thanks a lot, you know? <laughs> you know? You know, I'm just, um, where do you, do you have a location to receive this stuff? And do you have somebody there that can sift through it? Oh, great, you've given me all your, just your bare thread used clothes. You know, uh, we can send that over to the transportation department. They're using for oil rags, you know, anything. You've got to do that. So you've got to staff that. You've got to have somebody in charge of it. And how do you distribute the items? You're talking about something going that's really good and if people feel like they're not, uh, they're being cut out of getting the donations or feel like they're not, it's not fair, it will come back around. The media will come with the cameras and they'll say, why are you mistreating people that have been hit by the disaster? And, um, what's it? Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't dump the teddy bears out in your dump. Yeah. It'll be on the media news, CNN, there's the teddy bears we donated, they're in the town dump. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was a shelter manager, I had a, it was a, I, do, I was doing a night shift, I had Saturday night, I had this, uh, this caterer f that came up with all this food from a large catered wedding. And it was wonderful food. It was just eye peeling. I was like, thanks. And I took it in. I thought, I don't have any idea how long this has been out. I don't know who's touched it, what kind of flies have been on it. I don't know what's going on. And I had to just go and cry. I got to make sure nobody looking. And I had, I had to dump it because we couldn't have an outbreak of something, you know. Uh, our bathrooms were bad enough already. We didn't. <laughs> Um, which brings me up um, on sheltering. Your volunteers, you can pull volunteers. They don't have, they can be actually the people who were affected by the disaster. That's a huge thing is to pull people that need sheltering and they're in the shelter, get them involved in running your shelter. Um, I never really had, I had plenty of people that uh, volunteered to clean bathrooms. That was a huge help. And I mean, I had those, those were the cleanest bathrooms ever. They were getting cleaned about every uh, two hours. And I had the people that were living there who, uh, who were living there. For Katrina, that was probably true. They had been janitors. They knew how to do this. Um, they were glad to help. It gave them something to do. A lot of, uh, just a sense of worth and giving back was when I got people involved. And I asked, I said, hey, I need help. Can you help? Yeah, sure. And I had a lot of people that just jumped in. So a lot of times, you, the people that were helping, get them to help also. That's a great volunteer base there you can use, especially on the cuff when you need it. Um, continuity of operations. Can, is, um, can somebody share maybe some things y'all have learned in your continuity of operations with either your companies or businesses or um, agencies that it maybe have come up? Criminal court. Criminal court, definitely. You can't stop it, can you? District judge in Cumberland County is like, uh, 
I know y'all had a tornado, but where's my jury? <laughs> That's a good one. Half of them are living in shelter, so. So did you, uh, what, how did they handle it? How did y'all handle it? Stay on the ones that were for trial, and everybody had to be notified. And then you run into those of you that are lawyers in here. What are you going to run into when you have a defendant who wants to trial? And then something happens where it's changed the date, and he's not happy about it. So did y'all continue to have? No, they were moved back to another county. Okay. And uh, the ones that were on jury that were selected the jury, we provided escort via law enforcement. Picked them up where they wanted to be picked up, drove them to the jury day, picked them up and drove them back. So that's a great example. So you're, you know, you're using your police during your disaster, so you need to coordinate, hey, how are we going to do this kind of legal matters in the middle of a disaster? You can't let normal things stop. Some things you do, some things have got to continue. And that pulls in another partner that you need to talk about is your legal people. During a disaster, don't be surprised if we do these particular things. Have it in writing. Let everybody know. Um, I never think about the lawyers on that. <laughs> right. In the military, we always had continuity folders. So anybody that sat in that chair knows everything I know. When they sit in the chair, all the contacts because it's hard to replicate who you know and the contacts, mm -hmm. and it's there. And the process is there, the people are there, and so anybody can come sit in, pick up your book, open it up, and go. That's a, that's a good one, yeah. I also, you got, yes. I'm going to follow up on his. There also pertains to all sorts of record keeping. Mm -hmm. But Hurricane Katrina, a lot of cases against defendants in, this, in the county jail, were, the parish jail, were thrown out because the records were down in the basement. Yeah. Yeah. It's New Orleans. What are they thinking? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So the, uh, one thing we noticed is that sometimes you do a lot of preparing, you get into ruts or you get into ways of doing things. I started realizing how much was on my computer and how much knowledge or processes were kind of in my mind, and I really needed to get it all out and into uh, folders, uh, train other people three deep, uh, getting things out so that when I win the lottery or get taken by aliens, everything can keep going. I mean, that it's not like, where is this stuff at? It's in David's head. No, it can't be there. It's got to get out. It's got to get out to more people. No, I didn't. I did not say that one. I did not. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, there's a lot of that thing with trying to disperse out that information to make sure other people know what's going on. Uh, that maybe are not in preparedness or in your area, but that they know where to find things. Whether that's on the cloud or in a in a file drawer, out of the basement, you know, somewhere. Those kind of things needed. There are little things we don't think about. Um, assumptions. I put IT up here. It's a great one, and I did not plan to, uh, like a like a you know visual at the beginning. But the IT, we rely so much on computers and cell phones and things like that that that's a lot of what is your redundancy or how do you expect to handle things. Um, I love IT stuff, but I always want to know what the paper copy is if we ever have to go to paper copy because sometimes you can't get the computer to kick up your flash drive. I mean, it's just that's the way it goes. I don't care what they say about the cloud. Um, I always have just a bit of skepticism sometimes of what can happen. And so sometimes you're left with a chief, chief tab, tab there. Okay, and this one got, Dr. Schwab, definitely, I, this is what I was talking about. What kind of information do you need to collect during a disaster? I mean, a lot of times, this also comes up in after action reports. I thought that, I thought y'all were collecting this time information on people working. You didn't do it, but I thought that's what you were, nobody, you know, we weren't talking. So beforehand on the blue sky, you have staff in your county that you can pull during a disaster that you have a list of stuff I need you to track these things. Look for your really crazy OCD people to do this, not me. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm not, I tend to be more like a squirrel 
and so I'm not the person to do your timekeeping, but there are people I know that are good at that. They like doing that. You find those people, and a lot of times you put them in your finance lead. They may be a, a, an admin assistant. They may be really good. That's who you want in your ICS structure to do that. The other thing, too, is to talk with your uh, TDM district coordinator and say, look, what kind of forms and information and classes do you have on things you need for documenting your, the money spent, how we're supposed to, what kind of audit things do we need? If you know that beforehand, you get tra these people trained, then you're not, it's not all brand new to you when they're saying, hey, we want your receipts, and you come up with a grocery bag full of them, and the district coordinator runs, you know, because they don't want to see a bag of receipts. They, they want that system, that plan set up ahead of time. And that'll make your life a lot easier. And it can help when you have your recovery committee getting the money. It makes those flow, that money flow a lot better. I had a question. Mm -hmm. I heard that this community Van Zandt did not hit the FEMA threshold. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And that was, what, $37 million? Mm -hmm. Was the process to understand that in place here before the event happened? Or was that a surprise, too? And had they known that that was there, was there some changes in that process that would have got them over the 37? 37 billion is a state. It's a state, yeah. 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 Right. Bandit County's threshold was uh, uh, 186,000. Mm -hmm. So we met the, the county threshold. But well, we did not meet the state level. The state has to meet it before FEMA will come. Yeah. So we got state state uh, help. So we got SEA. So tell me, Vicki, if, if we had gone over the $37 million, it pulls down federal money at that point, right? So, and it, that's the problem of spring tornadoes. That's correct. Well, because it's the beginning of the year. And so they kind of do it by annual, don't they? Yeah, it's an annual event, yeah. Oh, it's the cumulative of all the events. No, 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 right. The event. right. No, it's, it's not cumulative. $37 million? Per incident. Per incident, okay. When it went from Benson County to Rains County, it was cumulative for those two counties. Right. But that yeah, was one event. But the tornado that hit the next day is a new event. Yes. Yes. Oh. It gets, it gets, that's the kind of thing you need to know so that when you're gathering your information, time becomes an issue in your date. So knowing that beforehand definitely helps. They have classes on that uh, that, that people can go to. Um, I mean, it's, it comes down to knowing that you're counting your volunteer hours. I mean, everything gets, it's, it goes into a formula. Yeah. Anderson County, did y'all meet y'all's thing for the flood? Did y'all have? I mean, that was bad. Yeah. You were, Smith County, we met. Yeah. Smith County. You couldn't release some data to make it work? <laughs> yeah. And I will say, kind of the thing is, is, is uh, Texas has a federally declared disaster. I think I think the average is about every eight months. So we got about what four months left before we have another one. But the only time that uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> what it, isn't it the most recent one? Because it's met their FEMA thresholds when we had all the floods through Austin and Brazos County. And yeah. So that was a multi-day thing and we were able to actually meet that threshold. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. I know I'm getting down to my time here. So just summary, if you don't remember anything about what we're doing, just manage your assumptions. You don't know sometimes you don't know what the question is, but just know that you're always your partners and your assumptions. Uh, put them together and talk those things out. That's the big thing to remember. You don't have to know what to do for the next disaster. Just start planning for it, getting people together. Um, that way you're not trying to run around doing it all by yourself. So I think, uh, I think the rest of your questions will be answered in the next sessions. So uh, thank you very much for coming thank here. You.